I'm going to be talking about innovations in sports equipment and sport, innovations in technologies. In particular, I'm going to be talking about innovations which have come across from other industries, larger industries, such as defense or aerospace or automotive. Because actually, you know, in the sports industry, we don't really kind of invent new materials, invent new practices. We take them across from other places. My main research is focused on the characterization of the performance of sports equipment. That basically means experimental mechanics. So going into the lab, firing balls around, firing balls against tennis rackets, and then often that leads in the development of complex models such as this, finite element models. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. So my main areas are experimental mechanics and finite element analysis, with a particular focus on tennis. So we'll start off talking about skiing. Early skis, very basic, so made from wood, very long, very kind of basic straps for bindings, very difficult to use. Major breakthrough, 1947, Howard Head came across and he applied techniques from the aviation industry, so from aerospace, and this was the laminated processes. So he created the first laminated skis, and that's how all skis are made now. And sort of going forward to the 1970s, we have the introduction of snowboarding, and I've kind of lumped the two together here. And then now there's a whole host of different skis, different snowboards. It's come in kind of different lengths, different sizes, different shapes, depending on you know, the exact kind of their use. But these are all made from laminated processes and composite materials. And as engineers, we can do various tests, such as bending tests. We can look at the mass. We can do sled tests to see how fast they go down the hill. And we can characterize different things. So then football boots, early football boots, very, you know, very basic, very rudimentary. Basically, just work boots, because it was workmen going out, playing football, using their boots. Coming forward, we've got vulcanized. You can't, I'm not sure you can see that that well. But we've got vulcanized rubber studs here. That was quite a big, quite a big breakthrough. This one here is particularly interesting. So this image from 1956 shows a Adidas, Adidas boot. And just before that, 1954, in the World Cup, Germany were kind of the underdogs. Everyone thought they were going to lose. But they happened to be wearing Adidas boots. And on that day, it was very wet. It was very muddy. The pitch was very waterlogged. And the particular thing about their boots was they had interchangeable studs. So they switched to longer studs and they went on to win the game. And that was quite a, you know, quite a shock. And a lot of people kind of credit that to sort of, sort of put Adidas right up there in the kind of public eye and, and say that that's kind of what's brought them forward to the company they are today. And then moving through to present, again, we've got boots made from a whole host of complex materials, and that includes carbon fibers and composite materials, similar to what we saw with the skiing and snowboarding. So again, this is tennis, my particular area. We went to Wimbledon to kind of collect the data, the Wimbledon Museums, went down into the archives and looked at all the rackets. And this is the data that I'm showing you now. So early tennis was played in courtyards. The heads of the rackets were asymmetrical in shape because this allowed the players to kind of reach down and scoop the ball out of these tight corners that you can see here. But actually, it was the invention of the lawnmower that allowed the grass to be cut a lot shorter and then it meant they could have more tennis courts, it made it open to a much wider audience because you know this court tennis it was, it wasn't really you know available to that many people. So lawn tennis you know, made it more popular. This developed into the modern game that we know today, and the developments in technology went along with this. 1980s was a real experimental period. So we've got looking at things like aluminium, carbon fiber, wood was phased out. And then modern rackets now are made from a whole host of different composite materials. So when we were at Wimbledon, not only did we just look at the rackets and take pictures, but we actually looked at their mechanical properties. So we said, right, you know, how long are the rackets? How wide are the rackets? How, what's their swing weight? What's their moment of inertia? And this here just shows the year across the bottom against the mass and the frequency, which corresponds approximately to the stiffness. So you can see the mass of the rackets remained relatively constant for until about the 1970s, because all the rackets here were made of wood. Essentially, the properties of the rackets were constrained by the properties of wood. And then in the 1970s, we get this 
drop off in mass. And you see the same trend in stiffness. So stiffness goes across, and from the 1970s, 1980s, you get this ramp in stiffness. So we can look at you know, how the rackets change. That tells us a bit, but really, we want to understand what this means physically. What does this mean to the players on the court? So we can look at some models. So we've got a mathematical model of a ball impacting with a tennis racket. We've got a trajectory model collected from wind tunnel data of the ball flying through the air, and then a mathematical model of the ball impacting the court surface. So looking at the different rackets, we've shown that there's a 17.5% increase in serve speed since the 1870s, 15% reduction time in the time available to the receiver, but most interestingly of all, a quarter of this change has come about since the 1970s, and that was what I showed in the last slide, this change we had all these innovations in materials. So now I'm going to kind of move on and talk a little bit more about how we can actually characterize these changes in kind of an introduction to technologies. What do they actually mean? So we've got running here, in particular, 100 meter sprint. This is Jesse Owens, 1936. And this over here is Usain Bolt. This is both in Berlin. So it's the same stadium, but there's a significant time difference between them. But when you kind of watch the videos, not much has appeared to really change. You know, they line up on the start line, the gun goes, they run 100 meters as quickly as possible. Relatively simple. Despite this, we've seen a significant improvement in time. Obviously, there's other factors, such as you know, the training and all this, but there are some kind of technology factors creeping in here as well, such as changes in the track surface, the footwear, the clothing. But the one thing that most people don't think about is the starting and the timing systems. So it's a different sort of technology. So as engineers and kind of researchers, we want to start characterizing this. So again, across the bottom, we've got the year, and we've got the time side. We can look at world records, but there's a few problems with this. First of all, you can have long gaps, such as there, when no records are being broken. Just makes it, you know, missing data, basically. The other thing is world records will only ever go down, so you don't get the, you don't get the full picture. We can look at gold medals at the Olympics. So again, much more consistent every four years. However, they don't necessarily represent the fastest time of the year. So what we've concluded to be the best measure is the mean of the top 25 results. And you can see here, you get a much better picture of how things are changing. And you can factor in things such as major world events like world wars, where you actually get a decrease in performance. And also, you can start looking at the effect of technology. So this line here represents the introduction of automatic timing systems. And you can see from this bit of data here that actually led to a decrease in performance. So this is a very kind of rare, sort of unique example of equipment coming in, technology coming in, and decreasing performance. So that's a sport where there isn't a huge amount of technology involved. What happens if we move on and look at a sport where technology and materials has had a large influence? So here we have pole vault. Again, year across the bottom, the height up the side. We've got the early period here, bamboo, an experimental period in the middle, and composite poles on the far side. So if we look at the world records, you can see these have increased, but then they kind of reached a peak, and then there's been a long gap without anything changing. We then have the experimental period, the first world record of a composite pole, 1961, and then since then, the sudden ramp in performance, and it's starting to tailor off again. So the question now is, you know, what's going to come next? Is something going to come next? Are we going to have to wait a long time? Is there going to be an amazing athlete that comes along? or will there be a new breakthrough in materials, such as carbon nanotubes, for example? So now I'm just going to summarize some of the innovations of the past. 
So these were mainly focused on materials. Just a few examples, we've got vulcanized rubber, Charles Goodyear, 1843. So tennis balls, tires, plimsolls, you know, some of the first running shoes. Plastic, 1905, Bakelite. This is used on the outside of modern footballs. Kayaks, ski and snowboard bindings, just to name a few examples. But probably the most sort of well-known and sort of most famous one is the engineered composite materials. And these came across from the aviation industry in the 1930s. And again, tennis rackets, pole vault, there's a whole host of different examples. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about some of the exciting projects we've got going on with high-speed cameras and image processing. So this is about creating a visual hull of a tennis racket which we can track around a court in three dimensions using a single camera. And the real important thing about this is the fact that we're using a single camera. So what we do is we have a camera in a fixed position, so up here. We then have our tennis racket positioned somewhere else on a single square like that. We take an image of that, and we then rotate the racket and the board together, take another image. We repeat this around 20 times. This gives us a load of different images. You can see here, we then put all the checkerboards into the same position, kind of virtually, and we can calibrate this, like we've got here, and we get a full 3D calibrated volume with a camera in each position. This, the origin, corresponds to the corner of the red board. So we've got all our cameras, and it's as if we've had one racket in the middle and taken all the pictures from a load of different cameras. We can then take the silhouette from of each racket using image processing techniques, combine these all together, and this gives us what we call the visual hull. And this is a 3D shape of the racket, which can be rotated and moved around. And what we're going to do next is go out on court, we'll have a single camera, and we'll match the silhouette that we get from the camera to the visual hull, and then we'll be able to track it. And this will inform all our experiments. So now I'm going to talk about finite element analysis. This is a cricket bat, and this is actually modal analysis, which is a very simple simulation. It runs very quickly. And we can look at how the bat oscillates and what happens when we change the materials, change the geometry. And we can run this lots of times, check lots of materials, lots of different shapes. Once we've done this, we can then look at the effect of a slightly more complex situation, which is where we fire the ball against the bat. But the interesting thing is that you can see the way the bat's oscillating here corresponds to how it oscillates when it's struck by the ball. So we can use a simple test, get an idea of what we're doing, and then go on to the more complex test. So another model we've created is a much more complex model of a tennis racket. So for this, we used a non-contact laser scanner. We take the racket, we scan that, and then on the far side, we have the geometry of the racket goes into the model. Once we've got our model, we want to check how accurate it is, so we compare it back against experimental data. So we're going back to robotics here. This is the International Tennis Federation racket power machine. Spins a racket round at a set speed. Ball drops from above, you get an impact. You can see here the ball flies across. Position just here is a set of light gates, which can measure the speed of the ball. So it's very consistent and very quick. We can spin the racket at different speeds, control the time of the drop, and we get a whole host of different impact situations. And then on this side, we have the corresponding model, so the computer model of the racket. So here's some results from a more complex scenario, we're actually looking at oblique spinning impacts, so more realistic impacts like we did have in actual play between a ball and a racket. So we've varied the, the inbound backspin, and we've measured the rebound velocity. And we did this for two different speeds, so at 18 and 28 meters per second. These dots are the experimental data, and each dot corresponds to a single impact. So we did about 30 impacts at each speed, and the solid lines correspond to the model. So we can see we've got very good agreement between our model and our data. We've got similar results for the rebound angle and the rebound spin of the ball. So then we know the model's accurate and we're confident that we can take it forward and use it. 
So once we've kind of we've tested our model against the experiment, we can go on and start doing some really exciting things. So what does this actually mean? What happens when we start playing around with the characteristics of the racket? So we looked at changing the stiffness of the racket. And this was for a whole host of different positions on the face of the racket. And we used the data from Wimbledon. So when we're looking at you know, how stiff should the racket be, we used you know, a very old racket, a very kind of flexible racket, and a super modern stiff racket. And you can see across all the impact positions, as you increase stiffness, you get an increase in the rebound speed of the ball, as you'd expect. And we got similar results for the angle and also spin. And we looked at other things, such as what happens when we change the mass of the racket, what happens when we change the balance point of the racket. And this all corresponded to the data that we collected at Wimbledon. Another really exciting thing we can do with the model is start looking at the coefficient of friction between the ball and the string bed. Very, very difficult to do in the lab unless you start producing specialist strings. So at the top, we've got the time across the bottom. So this is the time of an impact between the ball and the strings which is only around five milliseconds, so it's, it's very short. Hence why we use high-speed cameras. And then at the side, we've got the horizontal force. So the ball comes in, so it slides across the string bed, you get a horizontal force on the ball. This increases throughout the impact. Then you can see, around two milliseconds, it shoots up towards zero as the ball approaches the point of rolling, goes past, goes slightly faster than rolling, drops to zero, and that means the ball is literally just rolling off the string bed. And that is the case regardless of the coefficient of friction. So that's what happens at 20 degrees, which corresponds approximately to a player's shot. What happens if we, if we change the angle? What happens if we, if we increase the angle up to 40 degrees? And this is where it gets really interesting. So what we found was actually at lower friction, the ball rebounds with more spin. And that's counterintuitive to what people think. You kind of assume more friction, you know, more spin, ball will come off, more spin. It's not actually the case. When you have lower friction, you get more rebound spin. And the reason for that is because the ball is less likely to reach this point at the end where it's rolling, because the forces are lower. So as researchers, we can go out and we can fiddle around with these different models, and we can say, right, this is the optimum tennis racket. But as engineers, we need to actually to be able to produce this. So we'd shown that low friction strings are the way forward, but how are we going to produce it? And we looked, for again, for an innovation outside of sport, Teflon, 1938, and you know, traditionally known for non-stick frying pans. And that was what we applied with Prince, who are kind of main partner that we work with in tennis. They manufactured some strings, and we tested them in the lab. So we've got low friction here, high friction. And what we've actually got here is we've got a, a fixed tennis racket, and we're firing the ball in from above. And we're filming from over here, and we've got a mirror positioned underneath the strings. And this allowed us to see what was going on. So you can see you get a difference in the string movements. We're actually in the process of producing you know, a completely new rig, so we can really start looking at this in detail. So just looking at some of the results, again, each dot corresponds to a single impact. We've got low and we've got high friction strings. And we've got the inbound angle that we varied across the bottom. The reason we varied inbound angle was because previously we've shown that the rebound spin is sensitive to the angle. We've got rebound velocity and rebound angle, and that's you know insensitive to the coefficient of friction. So you change the coefficient of friction, you get no change. But interestingly here, you can see the experimental data indicates that at lower friction, so with the Teflon-coated strings, you get more spin. And that is also the case with the model. So the lower friction model gives more spin. And then finally, another thing that we looked at was the coefficient of friction between strings. So we have to start off you know, doing, doing things ourselves. So we got some strings and we, we lubricated them, and we sanded them to get different coefficients of friction. And we've got high friction going across to low friction here. We've got the rebound velocity and the rebound angle and the rebound spin on the far end. We found that at 40 degrees, there wasn't much effect. At 60 degrees, you get an increase in rebound speed and rebound angle as you lower the coefficient of friction. However, really interestingly over on this side, 
you get this peak for rebound spin at the top. And really, it's rebound spin that the players are interested in. And that peaks at about mid friction. So it depends on the exact conditions of the impact, which is why we're creating this visual hull of the racket so we can really start looking at players' shots in more detail, collecting a big sample of data, and relating our lab tests back to what's going on. But the main reason that we kind of concluded that you get this change depending on the inbound angle, because it depends on the complex mechanics, how the ball's rolling and how the ball's interacting with the strings and how the strings are moving relative to each other. So in conclusion, innovations from the past were mainly focused on materials. Going forward, it's all about knowledge. It's about understanding what this actually means, because you know, it's very well to create the lightest pair of football boots or the lightest football. What does that actually mean? You know, how does that affect the player? But once we have this knowledge, such as knowing that lower, fri lower friction strings are better, we still have to make them. So we're always going to be looking for innovations in materials and manufacturing techniques. But ultimately, it all has to come together and benefit the end user, so that's the player or the athlete. And all the tests that we do have to be relevant, and that's the, you know, the most complex bit. So if you'd like any further information, we have our own blog, engineeringsport.co.uk, which discusses kind of topical issues in sport and sports equipment. And then down here at the bottom, I've recently guest edited a special issue of the Journal of Sports Engineering Technology on predictive modeling in sport. And there's a whole host of papers which discuss kind of predictive, mo predictive modeling techniques I've been talking about today. And thank you for listening.